Et on va démarrer cette saison 2. Euh, donc bonsoir à tous, euh, bienvenue dans cette saison 2 du Paris Time Series Meetup. Euh, donc nous commençons aujourd'hui avec une présentation autour de Timescale, mais rapidement, pour ceux qui ne seraient pas venus à la saison 1, euh, je fais un petit rappel de, le, des objectifs du Meetup, qui je suis, ce qu'on essaie de faire, et ainsi de suite. Euh, donc du coup, rapidement, pour ceux qui ne me connaissent pas, donc Nicolas Schlemet, je suis indépendant, je travaille pour une société qui s'appelle Sérénité, euh, où je travaille sur des problématiques d'architecture, d'automatisation et de time series. Euh, je suis les time series depuis 5 ans maintenant, euh, je suis Influx Ace pour la France depuis 2 ans. Euh, donc en fait, Influx Data a mis en place un programme pour euh, on va dire, euh, valoriser les contributions des des personnes dans la communauté, donc qui a mis différents programmes en place, et notamment celui de Dinflux Ace. Et euh, j'interviens aussi dans le podcast Big Data Hebdo, où on discute euh, Big Data, Time Series, Cloud, et tout ce qui tourne autour de tous ces sujets-là. Euh, le Meetup, donc, il a pour but de promouvoir la communauté euh, et les acteurs français de la série temporelle. Alors, ce n'est pas forcément le cas aujourd'hui, mais on a, sur la saison 1, on l'a fait pas mal. L'idée, c'est de découvrir aussi donc, tous les produits et les plateformes autour de la série temporelle. Donc, euh, typiquement, aujourd'hui, c'est Timescale. Et c'est d'essayer de couvrir des usages basiques à avancer. Euh, donc, tout ce qu'on peut faire depuis bah, les phases d'ingestion, l'exploitation des données, éventuellement des usages de machine learning, comme on a pu voir à la saison 1. Euh, rapidement, donc, la saison 1, qui a été un peu hachée, donc, il y a eu euh, 4 meet-up. Hein. Le premier, donc, sur l'introduction aux usages avancés de la Time Series avec euh, Warp 10, plus un. Retour de VH Cloud sur tout ce qui est machine learning appliqué au time series dans leur contexte de data center. On a eu une présentation de, sur de Quasar DB qui est une time series plutôt orientée finance au départ, mais qui, était, qui a trouvé des usages dans le transport. On a eu un, un talk de David McKay de Influx DB, enfin Influx Data, pardon, sur Influx DB 2.0, euh, la version open source qui est, en bêta, qui est encore en phase de bêta pour le moment. Sur, euh, on a vu Flux et puis on a vu Telegraph, donc l'agent de gestion. Et on a fait, juste avant la pause estivale, un petit retour des Influx Days qui sont déroulés à, de façon virtuelle au mois de juin. Et euh, Mathias de, de Sense nous a présenté Flow, donc la syntaxe alternative à WarpScript pour Warp10. Vous, vous pouvez retrouver tout ça sur le site. Euh, donc vous retrouverez les supports, les vidéos. Et puis, vous retrouverez aussi donc, tous les liens utiles vers Twitter, la chaîne YouTube et ainsi de suite. Si vous avez euh, une vérité à partager votre, vos expériences autour des séries temporelles, vous m'envoyez un petit mail ou sur Twitter ou, ou comme vous voulez. Euh, puis on essaie de réfléchir à ce qu'on peut faire euh, ensemble. Euh, les meet-up de la saison 2, pour l'instant, il y en a deux qui sont prévus. Euh, donc aujourd'hui, on a un meet-up sur la plateforme Timescale. Le 13 octobre, on aura le fondateur de QuestDB, qui est un Français d'ailleurs, euh, qui viendra donc nous parler de sa solution. Et puis, j'ai essayé de caser donc, deux autres meet-up, euh, un en mi-novembre, euh, plus probablement, et un en décembre. Euh, donc, j'ai d'avoir un retour euh, d'expérience sur euh, Influx Cloud. Et un autre sujet, pour l'instant, je n'ai pas d'idée. Pas donc, euh, si certains ont des idées, qu'ils se fassent connaître. Euh, rapidement, j'ai essayé de reboucler aussi les dernières actualités euh, au niveau de la Time Series euh, sur les solutions qu'on a pu voir. Donc rapidement, je n'entrerai pas dans les détails, on a Warten 2.7.0 qui est sorti euh, il y a quelques semaines, début septembre. Euh, L'extension Flows, donc, dont on a parlé donc, juste avant la pause estivale, est sortie ce jour avec une version mineure de Warten, donc la 2.7.1. Euh, il y a InfluxDB, qui a, enfin InfluxData qui a publié un, un, toute leur roadmap en fait, sur la, comment ils allaient rendre euh, la version 2.0 open source disponible avec tous les choix en termes de stockage et de toutes les fonctionnalités que vous retrouvez dans cette plateforme. Donc il y a un biais qui est assez détaillé qui donne pas mal d'informations. Il y a les Influx Days, donc c'est une North America qui auront lieu les 10 et 11 novembre. Et il y a une formation Flux qui est organisée le fin octobre ce que ça peut intéresser. Euh, J'essaierai effectivement de rajouter au fur et à mesure des, des news. Il y a Grafana qui fait aussi une, une conférence bientôt. Il y a pas mal de choses qui, qui ont lieu. Mais sans plus attendre, je vais laisser donc Aftar nous parler. Donc Aftar est développeur de Kate pour Timescale. Donc bon, le, tout le reste du talk va être en anglais. Euh, on va lui donc on va le laisser. Il va nous présenter donc les fonctionnalités de la plateforme, euh, qu'est-ce qui les cas d'usage, la roadmap produit. Euh, des démos, enfin pas mal de choses. Et l'idée, c'est qu'à l'issue de son talk, vous puissiez euh, euh, 
euh, poser vos questions réponses pour ceux qui ne seraient pas à l'aise en anglais pour poser les questions ils peuvent me les mettre dans le chat et je les traduirai je les poserai et puis voilà donc sentez-vous assez libre sur vos questions voilà so after we let you talk just show me and make you uh, this hop là uh, yes And now you should be able to present. Fantastic. Uh, just let me know if you can see the screen. I think the sharing went through. Yes, it works. Okay. Great. Well, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this introductory talk on Timescale DB. Uh, as Nicholas introduced me, my name is Avtar Sirathan. I'm a developer advocate here at Timescale. And today we're just going to get a short Uh, introduction to Timescale, Timescale DB, and get you acquainted with the basics of the product. Again, uh, thank you so much to uh, Nicolas for the invite to speak. Um, I'm sad that I couldn't be in person today in France, but uh, wearing my PSG uh, t-shirt to, to be there in spirit. Uh, but I'm coming at you today from New York City, and uh, I'm excited to teach you a little bit more about Timescale and uh, how it fits into the ecosystem of time series databases. Uh, first up, just a little bit of housekeeping. I think you might have mentioned this already, but it's an interactive session. So please ask questions at any time in the chat in Zoom. Uh, and I can either answer them during the session, like while I'm going through things or at the end. Uh, I know we're going to make 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end. Um, and yeah, if you, if you have any questions about anything, don't hesitate to put them in the chat. Before we get into the roadmap for today, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. So my name is Aftar. Uh, I'm from South Africa originally. I now live in the USA. Uh, I'm super interested in how to use technology to empower people. That's why I really enjoy my job as a developer advocate here at Timescale. And part of my job is to learn new things all the time. And I document that kind of stuff on Twitter and on my personal website. So uh, if you'd like to follow along, uh, that's my handle on Twitter. And you can find my writing and things at aftar.com. That's my, my personal website. So you can follow along if you'd like to. Uh, and in terms of what we're going to cover today, uh, I thought we could do five things. So the first one is just get an introduction to what is TimescaleDB, how can you think about it, uh, give you a little bit of an overview of the database. Then we're go going to go into some pros and cons. So we'll go into uh, what are some advantages and uh, disadvantages or things that are tricky to use in, in TimescaleDB. Uh, then I'll give you uh, a tour of some popular use cases. Uh, here we'll be doing uh, demos and I'll be showing you some um, just sample applications that I put together just to give you an understanding of how you can use Timescale in different contexts. Uh, then we'll take a look at the roadmap and future work, some of the uh, launches and things that are going to come up in the future, things like Timescale, Multinode um, for, for scale out uh, deployments. And then lastly, I'll leave you with some resources Uh, for you to further your learning if you'd like to learn more about Timescale, and then we'll go into some questions. So that's our roadmap for today. Uh, let's get started with part one, which is what is Timescale DB? Okay, so the easiest way to think about Timescale is that it's uh, Timescale DB is Postgres for time series. Now, uh, usually when I do this talk, I have to go and explain, you know, what exactly is time series data? Well, how is it different from, from normal data? But since this is a time series meetup, um, I am not going to uh, repeat the, the, the basics for, for everyone. But uh, uh, instead, I'll focus on how Timescale um, is contrast to other databases in, in the time series database ecosystem. Um, and I'll, I'll weave in some examples of how we compare to databases like Influx, for example. Um, but the main thing is that Timescale essentially is Postgres for time series. It's the leading open source relational database for time series data, while many other time series databases are NoSQL. So things like uh, Influx, uh, MongoDB, stuff like that. Uh, time, time scale is actually a relational database for time series data. And it's actually packaged as a Postgres extension. I'll get into a little bit of, but about uh, how that actually works in a second. But the main, uh, highlights of Timescale is that it's optimized for things like consistently high ingest rates as you scale to uh, billions of, of, of data points 
um, giving you that consistent uh, rate of ingest. Uh, it also does well with high cardinality data sets. So this is important for use cases like IoT and DevOps. Uh, we also optimize for fast and complex queries. Uh, I'll show you an example in, in a second about how we compare to uh, InfluxDB on a variety of queries. And uh, the general uh, takeaway is that it provides you that high performance at scale with a great developer experience, uh, thanks to being built on top of Postgres. Okay, so that's uh, a quick overview of Timescale. Uh, one of the things that I mentioned is that Timescale is packaged as a Postgres extension. So because Timescale DB is built on top of Postgres, we inherit the reliability of the Postgres query planner. Uh, I'm not gonna go to, into too much detail um, for those of you who are unfamiliar to Postgres, but basically how things works is that uh, you have your time series queries handled by Timescale DB. So you can see here in the, in the SQL API, the time series functions and uh, full SQL compatibility. But the other relational or standard SQL queries are actually handled by the Postgres query plan as normal. Uh, and so uh, you can actually, uh, we actually leverage uh, things like the schema management and the storage layer in Postgres. Um, and so that's an overview of you know, how this actually fits into Postgres. Uh, it's as, a, as an extension. And um, one of the, the biggest takeaways that we've learned so far is that many users refer to Timescale as supercharged Postgres. Uh, and that's because it gives you a ton of like additional benefits. So uh, I'll go around this, uh, this diagram one by one. So the first one is accelerated performance. So you actually, thanks to using Timescale DB, uh, it actually increases the already very good performance on Postgres uh, for relational queries, but also more importantly for time series queries uh, and also gives you uh, better performance than uh, databases like Influx and Mongo for, for certain use cases. Uh, the other ones are things like massive scales. So you can actually handle um, uh, much larger scales of, of data, uh, things like hundreds of terabytes or petabytes of data. Um, I'm going to mention this in a second, but uh, the other benefit is that you can have relational and time series data together. So because time scale, each time scale instance is actually a Postgres instance as well, you can keep your time series and your relational data in one database and then do queries that analyze both of them uh, in the same place. Uh, that also is uh, uh, less complex to keep up with operationally. You don't have to upkeep two different databases and things like that. Uh, we also have uh, a cloud product and then uh, another uh, benefit that, that our users talk about is uh, the lower costs from things like uh, native compression, which I'll chat about in a second. But uh, that's the main thing. You, know, you can think of Timescale DB as Postgres for time series or Postgres supercharged with time series superpowers. Uh, so that's how I like to um, explain it. Uh, to give you a little bit of, it, of uh, an overview into how exactly we achieve the kind of performance benefits and the kind of um, better uh, query uh, times for um, a relational database. The one concept that I want to introduce you today is this concept of a chunk and a hypertable. So in Timescale DB, as uh, one of the features is automatic uh, partitioning of your data by space and by time. So uh, time is probably the most intuitive one. As data arrives in time, we partition it into these subtables, which we call chunks. And so Essentially, uh, you can think of uh, this as being like its own uh, little table. And then you can also partition your data uh, in space by maybe device ID or, or something like that. This is uh, by uh, hash partitioning. And so what happens is you have these um, uh, sometimes uh, thousands, sometimes millions of uh, chunks uh, in that, that are actually stored as, as regular tables in Postgres. But the way that you interact with them is through something called a hypertable which uh, as you can see in this, in this diagram, uh, it allows you to query the millions or thousands of chunks as, one, as if you were querying one single table. And so basically this is the abstraction uh, through which you actually interact with your database. And that's how it actually allows you to get uh, high ingest rates and fast query times. Because what happens is that when data is ingested, uh, it's not being, um, ingested into the uh, like a, a huge table or a bloated table. That's how things kind of get um, slowed down in time. Uh, a new chunk is actually created depending on uh, the time that you've set. So for example, every five minutes, I might want to create a new uh, small, uh, small chunk. 
uh, and that actually makes ingest a lot quicker, allowing you to get millions of data points per second and, and even greater than that. Uh, but the other thing here is that you it also optimizes for um, both wide and shallow queries as well as narrow and deep queries. So for example, uh, a wide and a shallow query is uh, say, give me the state of all my devices in the past five minutes. It goes uh, wide uh, because of all the devices and then shallow because we're just looking at the past five minutes in time. That's very easy to do just from this diagram. Say if uh, as data is coming in, the, the past five minutes is this row right here, uh, the nearest to, to the one, uh, the nearest to the left here. Uh, that would actually give you the past five minutes if this chunk represented five minutes in time. Uh, the other query that uh, we also optimize for uh, is a narrow and a deep query, which says, okay, for a particular device type or a specific device ID or something like that, show me all the history for the past three years or something like that. I want to see, you know, what's going on with this uh, this uh, device or in this location or something like that. And that's also very easy because it's just chunks of uh, this particular uh, in this kind of space partitioning here, where it's just all the blue chunks, for example. Um, versus you know the orange ones or the green ones, so that's an example of uh, one of the abstractions and how you how to think about uh, you know what's different about TimescaleDB DB to other time series databases and other relational databases as well. Um, and now that that's out the way and you have a, a better understanding of you know what exactly is TimeScale, I'm going to get into some of the pros and the cons. Okay, so. Let's start with the pros. So there's basically seven pros that I'm going to go through. Uh, each of them are, are very quick to go through. Uh, so let's start. Uh, this is an overview of them. Uh, for the first one is that time scale is free. The second one is that you have relational and time series data in the same database. Point number three is about performance. Point number four is about uh, SQL and the familiarity of that. Point number five is about the ecosystem. Sixth is the reliability of Postgres. And seventh and finally are the time series features. So let's get into the first one, which is that uh, TimeScale is free to use. So we actually don't have an enterprise license. Uh, there's a couple of different licenses to use with TimeScale. So the first one is that it, there's open source. So that's completely open source to use under uh, Apache 2 license. And then we also have our community license, which is a source available license, uh, but it's completely free to use. And it has all of our best features, like some of these uh, time series features that I'm going to talk about. Uh, and then you, there's no enterprise um, license at all. So all our best features are free to use. You don't have to pay to, to use them. And uh, the only way that uh, we make money from Timescale is through Timescale Cloud, which is a hosted and managed service. So if you're interested in um, you know, having your database hosted and managed for you in the cloud, then, then that's how Timescale makes money. But everything else is free to use uh, so that you know, people can use them regardless of their uh, economic situation, whether it's a, a big or a small project. Uh, the, so that's on the, the cost. The second one is something that I mentioned earlier, this idea of keeping both your time series data and your relational data in the same database. Uh, and uh, just going back to this diagram, the, the real benefit here is that it really simplifies your operations because you can imagine for a small team, instead of having two different databases to upkeep and having to learn two different query languages or uh, two different um, APIs or something like that. You just have one database where you keep both your time series and your relational data. And that also allows you to um, have queries that analyze both the metadata and your time series data in one place. I'll show you an example of that in the use case session that, section that we're going to go into. Uh, but yeah, the key takeaway here is that there's less maintenance complexity and it, it really streamlines operations, uh, especially when um, you know, you're dealing with, uh, uh, you know, teams that want to move fast and uh, want to focus on building their features versus, you know, maintaining the database. Uh, the third one is about performance. Uh, so this is where I'll bring in some, some nice graphs and, and things like that. But the main uh, one here that I'll mention is that uh, Timescale DB does really, really well with high cardinality data sets. So here's an example of a benchmark that uh, I actually conducted this benchmark in August. And it basically shows the performance comparison between InfluxDB and TimescaleDB uh, as the cardinality of the data set increases. So you'll notice here we have 100 devices with 10 metrics each, 4,000 devices with 10 metrics, all the way up to 10 million devices with 10 metrics. So we're just increasing the number of devices that are uh, sending data and plotting the ingest rate here as a graph. 
So obviously blue is influx and, and yellow is time scale. And the, and the story that you'll notice is that as the cardinality of the data set increases, uh, other time series databases, even though they're designed for time series data, don't really do that well in these kinds of use cases, whereas time scale uh, exhibits uh, much better performance than, than influx in this example. Uh, so that's the first one in terms of uh, what, what, what I mean when I talk about consistently high ingest rates is as you scale to these uh, large amounts of data, you know, in the beginning for a, a low cardinality data set, um, you could probably use any time series database uh, if, if ingest rate is your only, um, only metric that you're deciding upon. But as you get to the really high cardinality, uh, that's where we find a lot of people find benefits in, in time scale DB. Um, so that's just an example to influx DB um, uh, in this uh, on ingest rate. Then we want to go into uh, things like query performance and query speed. So uh, this is again from the same benchmark uh, that we did in August. Um, for a variety of different time series queries, uh, we found that time scale actually performs better than in this case influx DB on uh, almost all of them, and uh, these include things like. Uh, single roll up, so single group buys, you want to know uh, group by a certain number of um, metrics or a number of hours, things like aggregates. So in this case, calculating the max CPU over one host or eight hosts. Um, and then uh, as you get into things like more complex queries, like for example, thresholds, where you're trying to find the, um, the highest, uh, say for example, if a CPU is going over a certain amount over one or uh, all your devices. Uh, we found that timescale actually gets significantly faster than databases like InfluxDB, in this case for the thresholds, uh, you know, 870% faster, 514% uh, faster at, at higher cardinality for 4,000 devices. And then when you get into really complex queries, that's where a lot of our users have told us that, that uh, timescale DB really shines because uh, you can see here, uh, you know, up to 7,000% faster than InfluxDB when you're dealing with uh, queries of like finding the last readings for each of your devices for some time window, which is again, really important for uh, use cases like DevOps and IoT, where you have both monitoring and analysis uh, that you wanna do on your data. Uh, but this is not a, a talk about timescale versus influx. That's just to give you an example of uh, the query performance and the ingest performance. Uh, I'll link to a blog post if you guys wanna learn more about that later. But that's just uh, to give you an example of the kind of performance benefits that Timescale has over uh, other purpose-built time series databases. So now that we've tackled performance, let's get into some of the less um, quantitative aspects, which is uh, the query language, and that is SQL. And we think SQL is actually a huge benefit for uh, Timescale DB, mainly because it's the third most popular programming language among uh, software uh, developers in the world. So this is from the Stack Overflow survey that was conducted in, in 2020 on the popularity of, of query languages. And I think the main thing here is that, you know, as software developers, uh, we are busy. We want to focus on the, on the work that we're trying to do and making progress on our features and things like that. Um, you don't really want to learn a new query language if you can help it. And so the fact that uh, Timescale leveraged a SQL a language that a lot of people already know and the fact that SQL is, is super extensively documented uh, makes it a, a huge pro for using Timescale DB. A majority of people don't have to use a new query language or learn a new query language, and you can figure out how to uh, do whatever queries you want with the, the various documents that are out there on the internet. So that's uh, the point on developer experience. Uh, we just think it's, it's easier to use stuff that you already know. Um, then uh, going into the, the ecosystem, um, the, the point here is that uh, anything that works with Postgres works with Timescale. So because Timescale is built on top of Postgres, uh, you can use all the connectors and all the uh, drivers and things like that for whatever applications or whatever um, programming languages that you're used to using, you can use them with Timescale um, if they're uh, compatible with Postgres. And the good news is that because Postgres has been around for, uh, I don't know, 30 odd years or so, uh, there's a lot of things that actually work with uh, Postgres, uh, things like, you know, Tableau, Grafana, Datadog, you know, all these different things. These are just some examples that I've chosen, just Zabbix. Um, the other uh, benefit, so this is just, again, a comparison between um, InfluxDB and TimescaleDB in terms of like what's supported by it. 
uh, you'll notice that a lot of the one of the benefits is that um, ma the majority of different, um, let's say, uh, visualization tools or analysis tools or even things like uh, your data processing and stuff like that, uh, because Timescale is built on, built on top of Postgres, that means there's like first party support for Postgres. And as a result, you're using much more stable connectors and um, other products uh, in order to interact with your database versus uh, if you take an example, uh, a database like InfluxDB, because they have to build each of these connectors themselves uh, for things like Apache Spark or Apache Flink or something like that, uh, you actually have to use uh, something that someone else has built on GitHub, which might not be maintained as much and might not be as up to date. So that's one of the, the benefits of being built on top of Postgres uh, is that everything works with Postgres and because it does, um, it, it also works with timescale. Uh, and then coming to the, the end of the, the pros, you know, uh, extending upon this point of the advantages of being built on top of Postgres is this reliability. So for example, um, because the tools for things like high availability and backup and recovery um, have been tried and tested with Postgres, they also are the same tools that you use with Timescale DB. And so out of the box, you get, uh, you can use things like uh, Patroni, and uh, things like the um, PG backup and, and recovery tools uh, it, with Timescale DB, um, and there's extensive documentation on how to do that. And then the last pro that I'm going to talk about before I get into the demos uh, is the time series features. So Timescale has a bunch of uh, specific time series features that make uh, using it with time series data really nice. So the first one, I think I missed a slide. Oh no, okay, cool. So, so one of them are things like data management features that make dealing with time series data a lot easier. So for example, one of them are things like uh, continuous aggregates. I think uh, in InfluxDB, these are called like continuous queries, but basically these are just aggregates of your raw data um, that's come in so that you can say, for example, if you're collecting data every one second, you can have daily aggregates, 30 minute aggregates uh, to keep in terms of a time period that makes sense for your analysis. Uh, the other example that's very useful are things like these automated data retention policies on your raw data. So say, for example, you're ingesting uh, terabytes and terabytes of data a day, and you don't want to keep the raw data, data lying around. Uh, there's things like downsampling that allows you to actually throw away uh, the raw data after a certain period of time, but keep the actual aggregates of the data for your analysis. So again, if, for example, if you're ingesting data at one second, um, intervals, uh, you can actually throw away the raw underlying data to save space, but keep the aggregated, let's say hourly or daily, um, a maximum or average or whatever aggregates you're going to keep from that data. Um, one other example that I want to draw your attention to is actually one of our newest features called real-time aggregation. And the benefit of this here is actually allowing you to combine uh, the, the raw data and your aggregated data at query time in order to get the most up-to-date uh, picture of what's going on in your, in your systems or whatever you're monitoring or analyzing in the most efficient way possible. Um, and just a, a bit of background to this thing. So usually it takes a lot of uh, computational power to aggregate your raw data at query time. But uh, the, what you can do is set up this automatic, uh, in Postgres it's called materialization. So you basically calculate aggregates from the raw data and then they become these nice blue dots here. Um, maybe this is like the average value at each time period. But when you want to query, uh, the problem that you run into is sometimes these aggregates, these materializations, they run on a schedule and that schedule might not have been passed for that day. So you may run into a situation where you have raw data, but you actually don't have the averages for that day because they only get calculated at midnight or something like that. Uh, and you're not at that time period yet. And so what this feature does, it allows you to uh, automatically, when you just run the query, it will pull in uh, the raw data and aggregate it for you on the fly where the, you don't actually have the aggregates pre, uh, already calculated. So that's like an example of the, the kinds of features that we have that make things like uh, monitoring and analysis a lot easier. Uh, and then the last one is uh, these kinds of time series, uh, SQL analytics and, and features and functions rather, rather than features, where we make things like um, gap filling, dealing with gaps in your data and uh, things like, uh, I'll show you a, a, a function in a second called time bucket, where 
it actually allows you to deal with these common occurrences that you have when dealing with time series data, things like having gaps in your data and, and how to fill them. Uh, this is an example of uh, interpolation. There's also another thing where you can bring the last value forward. Um, and then we also have, uh, thanks to Postgres, support for things like complex window functions and, and things like that. So that's uh, an overview of the time, time scale pros. Uh, if there's any questions, you can, you can put them in the chat. Uh, now I'm going to get into an interesting part, which I honestly don't talk about that much, which is the cons of, of using timescale or maybe some of the difficulties that you might experience when you're, when you're getting started. So the first one is about schema design. And um, the thing here is that when you're dealing with a relational database, you have to have a schema and you have to put in some thought into how you're going to design that schema beforehand. And so that's something that uh, you know can be tricky, especially if you're coming from the NoSQL world, that uh, you're going to have to put some thought into how to design that schema. Uh, thankfully, you know these things are fairly flexible, and you can have a schema that uh, works for your your use case. And um, obviously, there's people that uh, are here to help at Timescale for that. Um, but yeah, so schema design is the first one. Uh, the second one is uh, a higher storage overhead. So uh, historically. Uh, relational databases have had higher storage overheads than, than NoSQL databases, um, mainly because of the, um, the, the things like you know, creating indexes and, and stuff like that. Um, I'll, we actually introduced a feature of compression, which I'll tell you a little bit about that helps to mitigate that. But uh, traditionally, that has been a, a con. And then also, uh, up until recently, we've only had scale up architecture where you can only increase sort of your instance size. Uh, rather than uh, running uh, multi-node where you scale out and have a bunch of nodes uh, and, and run things in a clustered fashion. And the last con is uh, since Timescale has a lot of powerful and configurable features, it can also be really complex to tune. And so uh, that's another con that you might run into. You know, There's so many different features and so many different settings. Uh, it can uh, take a little bit to get started. Uh, but thankfully, um, one of the things that I, what I like about working at Timescale is that we're actively trying to address a lot of these uh, cons, and in a, in a bunch of cases, we've we've actually uh, overcome a lot of these uh, these limitations. So, for example, with the schema design example, uh, you can actually overcome this for certain use cases. So, in the use case of DevOps and Prometheus metrics, uh, we've actually developed a tool that automatically generates a schema uh, for you, so that you just have to uh, plug it into uh, the thing that you're monitoring with Prometheus, and it will automatically create the tables and the schema and, and do it such that it's, it's the most optimal for that specific use case. Uh, so for these kinds of common use cases, you know, this is, uh, is a non-point. Uh, the other point about higher storage overhead, so we introduced native compression earlier this year, uh, or not earlier this year, early, uh, late last year in timescale 1.7, and that uh, actually brings down the storage overhead, overhead quite significantly where a lot of people are reporting uh, things like, um, you know, 94% uh, space savings and, and things like that. Uh, the other uh, point to take note of is coming up in Timescale 2.0, which I'll get into in the roadmap, is the multi-node architecture. So that's a point that uh, we're trying to, trying to solve right now, and that's going to be available for people to use in the future. And then on the point that it's potentially complex to tune and help, um, the Timescale team is here to help out. We have a public Slack, which I'll, I'll give you the link to a bit later. But there's also things like documentation and, and stuff like that to help you there. Um, and as much as possible, uh, the experience out of the box is good enough to use. And then, you know, you can tinker from there. Okay, so that's an overview of the cons. I think that's, that's fairly balanced from what um, a lot of the users that I've talked to have said have been, you know, difficult or, or some drawbacks for them to use Timescale. And these are the ways that we're actively uh, trying to work on the cons uh, that have come up uh, in order to make the, the database really really a good experience to use. Okay, now uh, it's time for the fun part. So I think I've got uh, a couple more minutes left, which is uh, around popular use cases. And um, the use cases, you know, if you if you know about time series data, uh, some of these <laughs> use cases aren't a surprise. So the first one is, you know, finance. This is a classic time series use case. Uh, Timescale is really good for that. We have a bunch of companies doing actually analysis on cryptocurrency data uh, using Timescale DB. Uh, a couple of other newer use cases are things like Internet of Things. Uh, so, for example, 
uh, device monitoring and, and stuff like that is one or two cool companies that are doing things like environment, environmental mon monitoring, where you're monitoring like uh, sensors about uh, air quality and stuff like that. Then you have your application metrics where you're looking at, uh, in this case, the example is, you know, how much advertising inventory is sold or unsold. So basically things like all different um, analytics about your application. And then lastly, uh, something that's grown more in popularity recently is uh, DevOps and IT monitoring, where you're looking at things like, you know, resource consumption in your Kubernetes clusters and, and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I'm going to run through a quick demo right now, showing you three different uh, use cases. So the first one is a DevOps use case where I'm going to look at microservice metrics. The second one is an IoT monitoring use case where I'll, I'll show you a dashboard of live bus locations in New York City, both with timescale. And then lastly, uh, take you through a couple of queries for IoT analytics uh, on New York City taxi rides uh, that uh, do some analysis on that. Okay, so enough with the, the presentation. Let's get into the first one, which is the DevOps uh, microservices. So let me switch. Uh, can everyone see my terminal? I think it's sharing fine. Yes, okay. we saw it. Awesome. Uh, there is a, sh a few uh, so questions. As, as you prefer, if you, you want to make them now or, la or later? Oh. Uh, one of the questions is pretty in depth. Uh, let me answer them at the end, because I think I'm going to go okay. through some of like, for example, the Prometheus one. Um, right now where I'll, I'll answer that question. Uh, thank you to Steven for asking them. I think I'll, I'll deal with one of the one of them at the end and, and one of them right now. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay. okay, so the example here is, so let me clear this so that it's a bit easier to see. But um, so in my, I've got my Kubernetes cluster right now and I've got a bunch of different namespaces and one of them is this namespace called demo, which has a bunch of microservices running in it. So I've got like an ad service, I've got a cart. Uh, this is supposed to be like a, a dummy shop that I've set up. Uh, there's a payment service and a load generator and all that kind of stuff. Each of these microservices uh, I'm monitoring um, with uh, this monitoring stack right now. So I've set up in a different namespace, um, timescale observability. Uh, the new name for this is uh, the, the observability stack for Kubernetes, where I've got uh, Grafana, uh, Prometheus, and Timescale DB, sorry, Timescale DB, that I'm using to actually monitor uh, the different uh, metrics that's that's going on here, uh, that's actually being uh, emitted from the different microservices in uh, this application. So the example, uh, the question that Stephen asked is, how do you make it work with Prometheus-like data model um, versus a schema-based uh, model. So the, the, the thing over here is um, we actually have a specific um, schema that we've developed where, let me take you into PG admin. So this is just, um, I'm gonna show you the example here where each of the Prometheus metrics and each of the series actually gets its own table. So this is metric, let's go into series. And it's gonna connect. Okay, so for example, each of the, and it's gonna open, okay. So for example, each of these different Prometheus metrics is actually stored in its own table. So you have um, one uh, table for things like, I don't know, this is just a metric uh, API server request total. And then you can use um, things like joins in order to, for example, join information about the series and the, the data, for, for example. Um, the more information about this can actually be found on the PromScale GitHub page that takes you through into how it happens. The, the biggest advantage of this is that you don't actually have to worry about what happens under the hood, that when, you, uh, when I've set this up, uh, the schema is actually created automatically. Uh, but I'll get into a bit more of that uh, in a second. So, uh, so that's the example here. And then if I go into my Grafana dashboard, um, there's a couple of dashboards that are created for me. So the first one is just, you know, monitoring things about my Kubernetes cluster. And this uh, data source is actually uh, using Prometheus. But because in my monitoring system, I can actually now use um, Prometheus and Timescale. I think it's this one here. So for example, here I'm, this is the wrong one. Um, 
DevOps use case. So for example, here, I'm looking at things like uh, the average uh, gRPCs for different uh, clusters. And I can actually query from both timescale at, or I can query from Prometheus. Uh, and so that allows you to use the power of both PromQL and SQL in your monitoring where, for example, for certain queries, PromQL might be better and for other queries, uh, SQL might be better. So that's the, the, the monitoring example. Um, obviously, there's a lot of complexity to go in there. The second example that I want to give you uh, to change gears a bit is this IoT example. Now here, what I have in front of me is a let me just find where I am in my script, uh, is a dashboard that shows the live locations of different buses in New York City. So buses on different routes are colored in each different color. And what I'm doing is uh, the data is actually being stored in timescale. And this is an example of like a real-time monitoring dashboard that you could set up. Uh, and also an example of how you can actually leverage both time series and geospatial data and timescale. So for example, here, what I'm asking is, uh, you know, show me the uh, real-time location of the buses and depending on what route they're on, you know, color them a different color. So this is an example of, you know, show me the state of all my devices right now. Again, a, a shallow and a, and a wide query. Um, and you can see here the data source is um, the MTA bus DB in Postgres, which is timescale. And uh, this is a, a fairly simple uh, SQL query. And uh, one thing to note here is that you can also combine timescale with other Postgres extensions. So in order to make the geospatial aspects of it work, I'm actually using something called post GIS in order to get these uh, latitude and longitude um, values and, and data types to, to show up on the map. The other example over here is, uh, so this one shows the real-time location of the buses. This one actually shows the buses that are uh, off route or for example, if you're in, in IoT, this could be your devices that um, are very hot or might be on the verge of failure or have a problem with them. Uh, it basically shows you, you know, which are the um, problematic devices or which devices of a, a fit a, a certain uh, segment. And again, here, the query is uh, SQL. And I'm actually using, um, again, uh, joins over here to join on, um, the relational data where I have the bus route. So I have this table called route geofences and I'm joining that with my uh, time series data. So this is another example of why, you know, having that time series and relational data in the same database is actually pretty useful. It allows you to do stuff uh, like this, uh, you know, which uh, actually has a ton of real world applications. Um, then the last thing that I wanted to show you, so this one shows you which devices are actually off route. Uh, you know, this works with things like Grafana and, and stuff like that. The last thing I wanted to show you is uh, some examples of like the uh, analysis uh, that you can do with timescale. So let me just log in here. So I've got four um, different tables here uh, in my database showing uh, data about taxis. So you can see here I've got, whoops. So I've got things like, uh, this is a, a table filled with uh, taxi data so it so, shows things like the time of the ride, the number of passengers, how far the trip was, how much did it cost, and a bunch of other, um, uh, what is it, uh, data points and um, uh, properties about a certain ride that might've taken place. And I've also got these relational tables that have um, basically mapping things like the payment type to an uh, English description, and I've also got another relational table that shows the, um, the description of where the ride was going, for example, or if it's a certain type of ride. And again, with, with Timescale, one of the great things that you can do is uh, combine both your time series and relational data. But one of the examples that I want to show you very quickly is an example of the uh, special SQL functions that you can actually use for time series analysis. So in this case, uh, I'm basically calculating how many taxi rides took place every five minutes for the first day of my data set. And you can use this function called time bucket that allows you to really make these very nice five minute uh, intervals. You know, I can change this very quickly to, if I want to look at things in like 15 minute intervals, uh, I can look at things in like, let's say three hours or something like that, 
where it's a much more flexible way if you want to analyze your data in different buckets. Uh, this, this function is super useful. And again, it allows you to uh, look at, you know, in, in terms of how the number of rides is changing per day, you can apply this to things like, you know, the uh, request to your website or some other uh, value that fluctuates uh, by time. Um, and then the, the last example is, you know, I already talked about um, combining time series and, and metadata in one query. Uh, okay, the screen is a bit small. So what I'm doing here is calculating um, for taxi rides, uh, looking at the um, uh, characteristics of the ride for rides to the airport in New York City. So for example, here you can end up with a nice um, result where for rides going to different airports, it actually shows me, okay, these are the number of trips to each airport. This is the average trip duration. This is the total that people have paid um, on average. And so, you know, if you're analyzing, say for example, I'm like a city planner and I'm analyzing, you know, what is the, the traffic to the airports or something like that? You can then um, write a, a, a simple SQL query like this. You know, the only thing that's complex is, is selecting the right things to select from here. And I'm joining the uh, relational data and the time series data in order to come up with a nice uh, simple table like this, which I can then use to inform uh, different analysis that I'm trying to do. So I know that was very quick, but I just wanted, uh, and probably quite a lot, but I just wanted to give you an overview of, you know, how can you actually use time scale in practice and what are the different use cases? Um, finishing up very quickly, just with some future work, and then we can get into some of the questions. So uh, in the next couple of months, we've got four big things that we're going to release. So the first one is time scale 2.0, which as I've already mentioned, has a multi-node uh, functionality. Uh, it provides uh, multi-node, elastic, and petabyte scale um, a relational database uh, built on top of um, Postgres, time series, relational time series database built on top of Postgres. Uh, so that's something huge to look forward to. That's probably going to happen in the next month. Um, the next thing is uh, the prom scale um, uh, open source connector, which basically provides analytics and long-term storage for Prometheus metrics. Uh, then the, the third thing is this um, really easy to install observability stack with Kubernetes, which is the thing that I showed previously that uh, sets up timescale Prometheus and Grafana to monitor your Kubernetes cluster um, in, in three lines of code. And then lastly, given that there's a new version of Postgres out, we're probably going to support that um, in the next uh, few months or so. So that's uh, also on the, on the roadmap, you know, supporting this new uh, Postgres 13. Okay, so that's uh, everything that I wanted to talk about. Just a quick recap of what we what we covered today. Um, you learned about what exactly is Timescale DB. It's Postgres for time series or uh, supercharged Postgres. We looked at the various pros and cons of how to use uh, Timescale and and when it might be good to use and what are some of the drawbacks that you might experience. I talked about some popular use cases and, and gave you a couple of demos of DevOps and IoT. Um, and um, analysis. And then we also looked at the roadmap and future work of things that you can actually look forward to. Uh, so if you're interested in, in Timescale, there's a couple of places that you can go to learn more. The first one is Timescale Docs, where you can get started with a bunch of different tutorials. Uh, we also have a newsletter that you can sign up for at this uh, link here, tsdb.co forward slash timescale newsletter, where uh, you can actually get updated on different uh, feature releases, different uh, product releases, uh, tutorials, blog posts, things like that. We also have a developer Slack. Uh, you can join it at tsdb.co forward slash timescale Slack, where you can meet other time series developers, ask questions. Uh, the timescale team is all there. The timescale co-founders are, are there and active. I'm also there, um, although I might be less helpful than other people. Um, so we're here to answer your questions. Or if you have any uh, questions about how to use specific timescale features, uh, that's a resource to look at. And if you're looking for a uh, the easiest way to get started with Timescale, uh, you can start a Timescale cloud trial where you get $300 in credits to try it out. Uh, so if you're looking for a hosted and managed database option, that's something that you can look at as well. There's also the, the community and, and open source versions that you can um, host on your own. Okay, so that brings me to the end of the talk. I'm going to take some of the questions. Uh, there's quite a lot of questions. They're pretty long. Um, 
So how, how should I do this? Should I just read them out and then I'll answer them one by one? Uh, I was mute. Uh, yes, you can do this way. It would be easier, I think. Be easier. Okay, cool. I'm just opening them up. Okay, so we've got some pretty hard questions from Steven. Uh, the first one talks about how do you keep track of chunks? Uh, I guess there's an index for key space. Do you have another one for hash chunk relations? If you're based on raw Postgres as a store, do you also inherit the B tree storage architecture? Then how do you ensure good ingest performance compared to other LSM based solutions? Okay, so this uh, question actually gets into the, the, the real weeds of timescale DB. Um, I, to be honest, I don't have the, the Postgres knowledge to answer this specific question, but what I can point you towards, and let me actually paste it in the chat, is a blog post that actually details uh, the answers to your questions. So I'm just going to find it right now, uh, cause I don't want to give you my, um, you know, non, um, expert answer on, on that, but basically there's a couple of ones that I think are, are good to, to look at. So the first one is, okay. Okay, finally in the chat, no. For some reason I can't actually type in the chat. Um, Okay, let me try this again. Um, okay, cool. Um, Okay, so that one I just sent, you can see how the internals of timescale actually compare to other, um, as you said, uh, LSM based solutions like, like Influx in, the, in that case. Um, uh, and if you have any questions about that, you can, you can hit us up in, in timescale Slack. Um, the other one is what is an acceptable value for the amount of series for cardinality, millions, billions. Um, it depends on your use case and how much uh, you know, computation power you, you have behind it. But you know, millions of cardinality. We we we've had you know extremely um, high cardinality data in into the billions, and I think depending on um, again the the size of your instance and and your requirements, uh, we we've had good um, results with uh, with those kinds of things. I think you know when you're dealing with that, uh, it's always good to uh, chat with one of the uh, timescale like solutions engineers or or one of the uh, folks on the um, on the team just to make sure that for your specific use case. But yeah, I think, you know, millions and billions, it, it, it does work. Uh, and then I already answered the question about um, the Prometheus data model. So that one said, how do you make it work with Prometheus um, versus a, a schema-based model? I'm just going to send you guys the GitHub link of the, um, the Prometheus uh, connector that we've just released called PromScale. Uh, and that actually gives you a good overview of how that works. So I just posted that in the chat so you can actually see, but basically what they do is, um, so there's a design document that I'll also post a link to that um, actually details in um, quite some depth about uh, how that actually works, and you know what what the the drawbacks and the uh, pros to that are. So I just posted that in the in the chat so everyone can take a look. Um, then the other question is: Does Hamsail DB only support the use case where data has a limited lifetime? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, Timescale supports the use case where data uh, has an unlimited lifetime as well. If you want to keep your data forever. 
Um, the the reason why we've designed those features about um, let me actually put this on the screen rather than the, the thank you screen. Um, the reason why we've designed those features about things like data, um, automated data management and things like a down sampling and stuff like that is because for a lot of time series use cases, people don't actually want to keep around their raw data um, around infinitely. We also have an option where you can have data tiering where, for example, if you want to keep some of your data in time scale for analysis and monitoring and stuff like that. But if you just want to keep your data around, you can actually have um, a thing where, you know, after a certain amount of time that gets moved into a uh, very low cost storage. Um, Cause the main thing there is cost. you know, if you're going to keep your data in the database for a uh, extended period of time and it's not being actually used, you can probably store it in a, in a cheaper way. So yeah, to answer your question, I think it's from Muriel. Uh, no timescale supports both the use case where data has uh, unlimited lifetime and a limited lifetime. And then they say, uh, does timescale support access policies where recent data would be in a time series and the rest in a classic Postgres table, for example? Um, I'll have to uh, understand, okay, and then you detailed your needs. Our temporal data isn't exerted in chronological order, but always in the recent past. The frequency of exertion is medium. And above all, we'll never delete the data, but need past, past performance read for all data. Yeah, so I think here yeah, the, the key is, okay, so Ryan actually posted a, uh, a link to a YouTube video about the SQL and, and the B tree architecture. Um, so the key here to your question, Mural, is um, I think, you know, when we suggest using timescale is that your data needs to be written in, in kind of loose time order. So the fact that it's not written in strictly chronic, chronological order is okay. But generally, you want to have things in, in time order. I think it depends on your query patterns. So in this case, you want to have fast performance read for all data. But like, how are you querying that data? Is it kind of like segmented by device where you're looking at like, okay, I want to know for like this specific device what happened 10 years ago or something like that. Um, it, obviously, there's a lot of, there's probably a discussion that needs to be had. I can't just, you know, um, from what you've, what, what you've provided. Um, what I'd recommend is uh, hit up the timescale Slack and then I can introduce you to uh, someone who can actually talk through your requirements and, and um, understand a little bit more about what you need. But from what you've said, uh, based on the frequency of insertion and how the data is divided, um, I think timescale might be a, a good choice, but depending on how you're actually querying the data will determine whether or not you get more or less performance and also depending on, on the schema that you've set up. So uh, that's probably an unsatisfactory answer, but that's it's the, the correct answer that I have right now. Uh, but again, you know, uh, timescale Slack and uh, you can reach out to me and I'll connect you to someone who can help further. Uh, if there's any other questions, uh, folks can put that into the chat. Yes, Otherwise, I, one, I can hand uh, it over to, oh, go ahead. I have one question. Um, for example, for when you use uh, Influx or Warp 10 or, or user solutions, you have a, an HTTP endpoint which is available by default, which is really convenient when you consider network, firewall, and so on, which is uh, like easier to than to open a Postgres port uh, over the network. Uh, do you, is there something? that we could use or do I have to build my own custom HTTP endpoint over um, timescale DB? Okay, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. It's actually the first time I've heard that question. Um, I, let me actually look this up because um, I think you're right. Yeah, the other, other database solutions actually have that HTTP, HTTP endpoint. Um, the the thing that we've had people use the most is as you've mentioned having that um opening the the postgres port port 5432 or whatever it, it might be um i'm actually not sure like what the the solution would be if you didn't want to use that most of the time when we have people interact with timescale it's through that uh that postgres port but um i can actually see there's there's other things out there for example there's um something called Postgres, which is a Postgres um, 
it turns your Postgres database yeah. into these kind of web um, API yeah. endpoints. Yeah. So there's a bunch of, uh, I, I would recommend you check out like that kind of stuff where, um, I'm just gonna put the link in the chat. Sorry, I've got way too many screens open right now. Um, <laughs> that, that might actually uh, have equivalent behavior, but Timescale doesn't provide anything like that. If you want to use that, uh, you just have to use one of the, the Postgres solutions, which, which would work with Timescale. Okay. But that's, that's a good question. I've never actually um, had that one before. All right. Th thanks everyone for uh, listening. Again, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to talk at this uh, meetup. Really appreciate everyone's time. Um, and with that, I'll hand it over back to, to Nicholas if there's no more questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, okay, but so thanks a lot, Dev It was really interesting to have such a, a presentation. Thanks to all people who joined today. Uh, so I will take all the links and paste them somewhere uh, so, so that you can uh, refer to them later. Um, and as it was recorded, you can watch it later this week if you need. Uh, and that's all. And so see you in two weeks uh, with the Quest DB presentation. And I think that's all for me. Yep. Steven, tu, tu as une question en plus. Non, c'est bon. <laughs> I wanted to thank you for uh, the meetup. <laughs> ah, you're welcome. It's always a pleasure. I, I have to, to leave. Uh, so thank you also, Avtar, because for now, I just need to cook for my children. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you both. Thanks, bye. Steven. Thanks thank for coming. Bye, bye Steven. Um, merci à tous, uh, so thank you all and uh, see you next time.